Yeah, okay. you're good. good. How is this for a panel, right? <laughs> I feel like Sooner Square. I know. <laughs> like, I'm surrounded by fame. It's so weird. <laughs> off, off, off. Oh, we should, we should go to the, I think we should go to the first slide. How's that for an idea? That's a good um, So on my left here, your right, uh, is Mr. John DeCure. Um, John was at the very, very beginning of the development plans for Epcot, and he's going to tell us why there is even a spaceship Earth, because uh, there's always a reason for everything, right? So right. I, I will yes, let sir. you start with that. All right. Well, uh, I began early on and was invited to come to WED. Uh, I had been at WED for about three years, uh, sort of doing a little illustration work, did some ride work, did, worked on the Hall of Presidents, and some interior contemporary work at the, at the Contemporary Hotel in the Polynesian, and worked uh, for Marvin Davis, who at that time had done a lot of work on the master planning on Epcot for Walt. Uh, I went away, took a three-year sabbatical, came back, and began a pretty intensive study on, on the master planning for Epcot. Because I'd had that previous experience with Marvin, I was sort of prepared for that. And it was early on that we determined, decided, Marty decided with John Hench, that we needed a, a, a major introductory show uh, for the project. And uh, hadn't even conceived the name Spaceship Earth yet at that point. Uh, but we called it the Future World Theater. And uh, I, there's a rendering me, of me somewhere here where, where I'm painting this, yeah. this great auditorium with thousands of people. Well, uh, we'll catch up. We'll get to it. So I, I just want to show yeah, we had no idea yeah. what was in that theater yeah. at the moment. <laughs> but uh, uh, so let's, let's go to the next slide. Oh, this one. So yeah. we started to look at the historical precedent for these kinds of uh, exhibitions that predicted better ways of living. This was what it was all about. This was what the basis of everything that Walt had talked about was, was developing and uh, promoting and exhibiting new ideas on better ways of living. And many World's Fairs previous to that had, uh, had accomplished that and had done that. That was their theme. So we went back and took a look at some of those previous experiences. The early Paris Exposition with the Eiffel Tower, uh, the 1939 World's, well, and there's some other historical moments here. Yeah. Uh, and got to the point where we got to, I think in the next slide we get oh, to, yeah, here's we, the there we go, we get to the 1933 World's Fair. And that was pretty prophetic because it was a sphere, it was the earth, and inside it there was a city of tomorrow. Uh, and, and some large circular rotating beltways that people could, could travel on. Let's go to the next slide. And, uh, then uh, there was the, the, the whole issue of, uh, of uh, the carousel of Let's go to the oh, yeah. carousel. Of, there we go. Uh, the carousel of progress that was in that 1933 World's Fair, uh, and that again was this idea of better ways of living, using observing technology and how it helped us. But when the when the show moved to Disneyland, uh, at the top floor there was again this model of the city of tomorrow, uh, and so we. Uh, we began thinking of what would be our icon show, what, what would be the, the moment that uh, people could first get an idea about what Epcot was all about. And that's when we, uh, we started moving the pieces and the parts of the project along. Actually, when, when I first started to work on it, uh, uh, John Hench said, take your time, John. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to happen for a long time because we're going to start with World <laughs> Showcase. Uh, and it, actually, I think, it, as I recall, it was positioned to be up by the Polynesian Hotel oh, by yeah. the Lagoon. Uh, and the original design walking in the door for me was a very contemporary uh, uh, facade for each of the pavilions, almost like an airport design. And uh, uh, a gentleman came, and here we were sort of moving those pieces and parts around, trying to figure out uh, just how Epcot worked. The one on the right, though, was, was we were beginning to struggle with the idea of bringing uh, Epcot and uh, and uh, Walt and World Showcase together, because the uh, whoopsie lost this. Excuse me. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
because the, the uh, marketing and branding efforts for World Showcase were not going as well as projected. And, uh, uh, but the Epcot pavilions were, were getting a lot of attention from corporate America. And yet, we all felt that the, 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 the World Showcase was very important as an international statement. In fact, in this particular plan, there were notions that World Showcase would surround the, the Communicor Spaceship Earth concept, which at that time was still you know, emerging. That big gold sketch that you can see in the other room, it's up yeah. on this slide, was really the first piece of art that sort of tried to predict a, a gathering place, information center where the monorail would arrive, where there would be a pre-show, but it was still pre-Spaceship Earth. Yeah. And you said even on that one, it was just, you were just indicating that, were, that there were pavilions. Yes, you can there see to the left. There was not anything specific No, in, we just felt that there, were, there would be these the pavilions that would demonstrate uh, better ways of living. Uh, and then the, uh, the master plan began to take shape. You can see that big gold sketch in the, in the, in the background there that we're sitting. Boy, we had a lot of hair in those days. <laughs> uh, and that was even prior to that, that was the, 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 the growth pattern of this future world theater that eventually became Spaceship Earth. Yeah, and this is the one that you said, we've, I've always been fascinated by this picture because I'm like, what's going on in the middle of this with all of these people like looking in on this and then you said. Well, unfortunately, we didn't have an answer to that at that time. <laughs> and in fact, that is when Marty called in uh, Ray Bradbury. And that's when Ray walked into the room. There we go. And Marty locked us in a room and, and, and asked us to begin to really dream and think about the, uh, the story. And uh, Ray was, uh, you know, very persistent that he had just written an article for NASA on uh, oh, landing on the moon. And uh, he said he had a terrible time struggling with it and he couldn't get it right until he found a metaphor. And his metaphor was cut through. Christopher Columbus discovering the new world, and when he got that, and he, he structured the article around that metaphor, it was quite well, he thought. And uh, he said, we've got to find a metaphor. And we did search, and, 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 and this is then what led us to Buckminster Fuller and his operation manual, Spaceship Earth, and the idea that we are traveling through the universe at thousands of miles a second. And that we better take care of Spaceship Earth. And, uh, it was then that, uh, because Bucky had also designed the geodesic dome, that all the pieces that we'd been researching seemed to come together. The idea of an icon monument, a sphere that represented the world, uh, a sphere that could be traveling through space and leading us into the future, and the pieces began to fit and come together. Ray was insistent that we tell the, the prologue to that story of the future by looking into our past and singling out key communication moments and a RISE system uh, to take us through those uh, communication moments that you know very well, uh, seemed very appropriate to leading us into then the Communicor, which was to be the, uh, the modeling warehouse idea center for new ideas that would lead us to the pavilions. Uh, originally that ride was, was talked about being underground uh, until I think Bob Gurr got involved. But, <laughs> See, that would have worked better. He might have stayed had they yeah, done that. You know, right? I, I, I understand he had a good talk this morning, and he talked about my father. Uh, and my father was a rather flamboyant, creative guy, and he, apparently Bob was in a meeting on, uh, as I understand it, was in a meeting on uh, uh, Energy Pavilion, and came in and gave them a lot of wonderful ideas, and then said, good luck, boys, and left the room. <laughs> and got on a plane and went. He was always somewhere in the world besides where he was supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. And it was, but it was fascinating. At this point, the dome was used for projection at the end as a finale, right? But the main ride was actually not inside of the geosphere. It yeah, was we, we had the, behind we, it. We had the pre-show of descending in time and then the ride, going through the ride, and then coming up back into the dome for the finale yeah. into space. So if you see those old, I don't have a photo of the model, but if you see those pictures of the model where it's it's kind of like a brownish dome, and then there's this large kind of open space behind it. That's because the ride was underneath that large open space. So you look at that model in a completely different way now. Yeah, like I said, Bob took care of that real quick. Uh, <laughs> no, there were things down there that just didn't allow us to do that, and it eventually had to. Yes, yeah. we have the water but, table in Florida. You know, I, take, I kind of take that, I follow after my father, uh -uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, little DNA in there. So as we get to this point, you know, I, I escaped too. 
<laughs> went back into live action film flying around the world and, uh, and left it to these good people to figure it all out, <laughs> sitting over here on my left. But, uh, Which brings us to Peggy. Hello, Peggy. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Those are some old pictures. <laughs> yeah, well, tell, tell us how you got your start here at uh, WED. Well, so my start starts a little before that. I started at Disneyland as a ride operator on Storybook Land. And I, it was a great summer weekend job. And so I worked in the park for five years. And in 1969, they took 10 of us out of the park to bring us to Central Florida to participate in the press conference that would announce the first phase of Walt Disney World. And they were just moving dirt around at that point. So Seven Seas Lagoon was excavated. They were moving the dirt to the theme park site. I took a look around and thought, this is so big, I really want to be a part of it. So I went back and started talking to people at Disneyland and finally, I met John Curry, who was going to be heading up the hotels, and John had lots of hotel contacts, but this was a new venture for Disney, and so John wanted some Disney people um, on his team, so he hired me to be the supervisor of guest activities, great, child, child care in the Mouseketeer clubhouses, information tables in the Contemporary uh, Resort Hotel in the Polynesian Village, and then, um, and I got here about six months before Walt Disney World opened and um, got to see everything come up out of the ground in 1971. And, and then, there were, then Roy Disney bought uh, us out of the U.S. Steel deal. And so um, I, I found myself in convention sales and I, I learned to plan meetings. And so five years into that, I bumped into Marty in the, in the breezeway of the contemporary and I said, you know, this has been a great experience, Marty, but I'm kind of thinking about what I might do back in California. And I was thinking, I don't know, Magic Kingdom Club maybe, or... And he said, well, you know, we're starting to plan Epcot, and I want to kick it off with a series of conferences. And you have been here planning meetings, you know Walt Disney World, so why don't you come back to California and work at WED? Which was amazing, because I'd never imagined I could be there. And so for the first year or so, um, we hosted conferences on the topics of uh, future world. We brought experts together. We formed advisory boards. We'd bring the advisors back in to meet with the creative teams. And then probably in the late 70s, Marty said, well, why don't you do the historical research on Spaceship Earth? because we want the pavilions within Future World to have different tones. And Ward Kimball, as we all know, was taking a very wacky, whimsical approach to World of Motion. And Spaceship Earth being the theme show for Future World, Marty wanted to be sure that that had sort of a, an authoritative tone. And this is something I'd never done before, but uh, it was a fabulous assignment, and I loved it. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out uh, to show how my fevered mind works uh, in, uh, in these pictures that uh, Peggy was nice enough to share, there's the picture on the left of them in the hallway. Okay. If you look at those storyboards on the, on the left-hand wall, uh, those are the storyboards for the fourth finale of Horizons that was never filmed, where you know where you could do a, a undersea or the desert or outer space, there was going to be a fourth one where you go through the city. And that's what those storyboards are for, but they never filmed it. So anyway, just a cool thing I found in your photo. <laughs> so do, should we step through the attraction a little bit? And, and yeah. Richard, you can, you know, throw it. So I think you had a little bit to do. You, you provided some of these photos, right? So this is the, some early concepts for the, well, not even early concepts, the load station. So this is the load area. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was, um, we, it was so, uh, such a tight space. And, um, we, you know, in the model, we were going to be working out the, the space limitations, and um, I was really busy with other areas of the show on the model effort, and we hired a gentleman named Joe Garlington, and um, he was the one that defined that space, I think, better than anybody, and um, it was supposed to be very similar to a, it was a time machine or a particle accelerator, and um, so Joe worked on that, and um, uh, Trevor Bryant assisted him on the model effort for that. And it's funny, I, 
uh, I walked into the trailer on site and um, a gentleman, much older than me at that time, uh, said, uh, gave me a t plane ticket and he said, you're going to um, New Jersey tonight. And I said, why? And he said, well, you have to buy off the perforations in the aluminum panels, or otherwise, you know, <laughs> they're not gonna be delivered in time. And um, so he gave me a plane ticket and drove me to the airport, basically kidnapped me, and I <laughs> gave me a hotel room in New Jersey. I showed up at the place, it took me two minutes to look at all the panels and go, yeah, they're fine. And then I, I got on a plane and went back to Florida. That's fine. So Peggy, you, uh, your research, you, you did a lot of deep dives. And of course, this was before the internet, before oh, yes. you could hop on Google <laughs> and do that way sort of thing. Way. So uh, tell us about you know, what went into a scene like this of, of so, finding out the background. So uh, I'd been an English major, but um, but I think uh, is there clapping? Shout out to the English majors. <laughs> um, and you know, when yeah. I was in college, if I if I had a paper to write, I'd find a good source and I'd write it from that source. But I have a little brother who was um, like preschool when I was in college, and he had a passion for trains. He would come home from the library with picture books of trains of all sorts, and he'd open them up all over the floor of the living room, and he would study those. And then he would persuade my mom to take him to the railroad station and watch all the trains go by, and he could name every one of them. And so his approach to research inspired me. I thought. You know, I am going to, I've never done this before, um, uh, but I, I love the fact that I get to go back into time and look at, at cultures around the world. The wonderful thing about the Cro-Magnon scene is that National Geographic was beginning to do wonderful photographs of the caves of Lascaux, and, um, and so we had fantastic photographs of that area. Uh, and, and that was, you know, and it was interesting because we'd have conversations. I worked with a fellow named Pat Scanlon, and, and Richard says that when Pat or I would walk into the model shop, he'd just like, oh dear, what are they bringing me now? <laughs> <laughs> but Pat would be talking about the crude drawings on the walls of caves, and I would be taking the National Geographic and saying, nothing crude about There's this. These, crude these about are just it. breathtaking. So if you haven't looked at them lately, I, I recommend going back. Didn't you tell me that the, the, narr the ride's narrator did the uh, shaman yeah. here, did his voice? Yes, yeah. so Vic Perrin was the original narrator of Spaceship Earth, and he's also the voice of the shaman. And so, you know, when we were doing the Egyptian scene, the Phoenician scene, the, the Roman scene, the Greek scene, we found people who actually spoke those languages. But what did the Cro-Magnon language sound like? And so Vic Perrin made it up, and he, I, I remember it was something like, Mari Mutir, Mauskidum, Umbade, Umbade. <laughs> yeah. Remember that part? <laughs> Fans call that guy Umbade today be <laughs> because of that line, yeah. Of course, the same level of uh, study went into the Egyptian scene as so well. So we found, we, had, we have a wonderful research library at Imagineering, and I, I, my name is on half the books there, and they were such a great resource because you could say, I need an Egyptian expert, and they found a local professor, Dr. Degrassi, and, um, and I called him up and said, we're doing an attraction, we really want authentic hieroglyphics, uh, so I took him out to Tahunga um, because the team there was looking at what's the, what kind of material can cover the walls that will simulate sandstone. And I think they were grinding walnut shells or something at that point. Yeah, that's great. No. Okay, and, and carving in bas relief, just random hieroglyphics. And Dr. Degrassi stood there in con deep contemplation and then he turned to me and said, this doesn't say anything. <laughs> I said, exactly, that's what we need you to do. And so he would hand draw the hieroglyphics, 
that you would see on the columns and tape them together and bring them to our office in Glendale. Um, he also found a letter that a, a pharaoh had written to his vizier, an administrator out in the land, and this letter essentially says, and you, you know, in the scene, the pharaoh is dictating a letter to a scribe who's, who's writing on papyrus, heretic writing, and, um, and the pharaoh is saying, you represent me um, out in the field and I expect you to conduct yourself appropriately. And if I may. And I thought uh, it was fascinating that you said you had to find like the one exact period in time. Oh, we did because you you know the Egyptian history goes on very long. There were so many pharaohs, but we needed one where it was late enough that so it was early enough to have um, her, uh, hieroglyphics being carved onto the temple walls, and then we also needed it late enough that they were writing on papyrus and turning, and you couldn't. You couldn't write the hieroglyphics as precisely on papyrus, so it became a kind of cursive writing, more heretic writing. And so the pharaoh says, "In suit and seshnet suit, chati imen hotep, ankwaji seneb, imirahe tani jat jat, and titima." Of course, he researched uh, Phoenician, too. And I called, uh, so again, the, our, our IRC, the Information Resource Center, found a professor in, I think, Minnesota. Um, and I called him up, Dr. Kramelkoff, and I explained what we were doing. And he said, oh, you won't. I can't believe this. My kids, I'm the, you know, I, I study ancient languages that no one speaks today. And my kids think I have the most <laughs> irrelevant, dusty job. <laughs> Wait till I tell them that Disney wants me to provide the, narrate, the, the dialogue between the ship's captain and the merchant. So again, Nahim Habri Hayawani, Anaknulolek Sohortoka Li Tarshish Kiko Eshatnuko. It's like, sure, I'll take your stuff to Tarshish. Is it true that Joe Rohde ended up doing the oh, voice that? Oh, well, that's for that? in the Roman scene. Oh, in the Roman scene, so okay. We'll get there. All right, but Richard, you, <laughs> you, you have a story about star placement in this scene, which is, I think, very critical. Oh, yeah, that was, um, uh, we were dressing out the, the boat and adding cargo. One of the items that um, I, I came late in the day, as it's more like nighttime, and uh, John Ruck, the, the um, audio engineer with a couple of helpers was manhandling this giant piece of cargo. It was the size of a refrigerator, a side by side. And there's only so much room in that boat. And I said, John, what is that? And he goes, it's, it's the speaker. And I said, what is the speaker for? And he said, it's for the dialogue, which is? Nahim Abri, Ayawani, Phoenician. And I said, why, why do you need a speaker that large to do somebody's whispering and talking very quietly like this in the middle of the night loading cargo? And he goes, I showed you the cut sheet and it had the dimensions on it. I said, John, let's make a, a smaller speaker. It'll be fine. You know? uh, that, was my first, um, that was my first experience with technical people who fall in love with the technology and they go for the best and the biggest. And sometimes it doesn't always comply with the scene. Yeah, is this where the gun was or was that in a different scene? What's that? The gun. Oh no, the fiber op. Oh yeah, yeah. no, this it was this scene. Okay. I forgot about that one. <laughs> um, we had to place fiber optic points in the psych behind uh, the boat. And they were, um, you know, fiber optic points and I had to place those. They were all the way across uh, the stage and I was sitting in the ride vehicle and a laborer with the BBC, BBCC was up on a scaffolding. And I said, okay, let's start. And I said, okay, there. And he went, I said, no, no, lower. And he'd go like that. And we were spending, we spent about 10 minutes and I said, this is not gonna work. And I went to Big Five and I bought uh, an air gun. And uh, I bought, at that time, you could buy darts with a little fletching on the back, and um, they would have points on them, so they would stick in the drywall. 
So uh, I, I excused the guy, he could go home. And uh, I came back into the building with an air gun and my pocket full of darts, <laughs> and I placed all the fiber optics. But one of the security guards had seen me come into the building holding <laughs> a gun. And, uh, and after a while, we had three or four security guys up in the scene. They were looking for a guy with a gun, and I was standing there with the gun. <laughs> and um, so anyway, that got worked out. But then the next day, the next day, one of our special effects guys says, give me the gun. And I gave a gun. And he, um, he did an entire steampunk uh, st treatment on it. So there were dials and other attachments, and he sprayed the whole thing brass, and he put a label on it that said, a fiber optic location device. <laughs> so you ever had the theater where they were performing, it was Oedipus, right? Yes, they were performing. right. Uh -huh. But Peggy, you told me about an effect that you all attempted for this scene that didn't really work out. Well, you know, the great thing about Imagineering, Wed, is that you get to do things you've never done before. And because I'd been working with, uh, with the audio department on recording the, the dialogues, I thought, you know, the Greek scene, there'll be an audience behind. You won't be able to see the audience, but we're suggesting that you're part of the, the audience as the vehicle moves through the scene. So wouldn't it be great if we just could find a way to replicate the sense of an audience? And so uh, I, I recruited three or four other Imagineers. We got some duvetine. We sat on a little bench in the, in the recording uh, booth. And the idea was, you know, people are there in their togas, and they'll be shifting their weight throughout the performance and maybe scratching their arm and um, clearing their throat. And, uh, and so we, we did that, and then we laid that down several times, and the effect was like an asylum, like people were <laughs> ridden with fleas, and <laughs> so we never used that. <laughs> and I didn't become one of those directors. <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't even think I ever noticed on the ride that there was a whole, there was an audience behind you because you're so rake, focused, right? Yeah. It, there was a raked audience scene that was really quite a rake. It was, I forgot what the angle was, but um, a couple of years later, we were working on a redo, and I walked through on third shift, and I noticed a, a square cut on the side of the audience, that mass, and there was light coming out of it. And someone had taken a saw and cut through the drywall and made a hatch. And I walked over, I pulled on the tape, and um, apparently the third shift guys had made a whole apartment up there with <laughs> mattresses and lights and, <laughs> and everything else. And um, I don't know if they went there after their shift or they just spent third shift watching TV <laughs> and Spaceship Earth in the Greek theater scene. If there's any third shift guys here, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> so we have room, so I should shout out to the little projected animated charioteer guy. <laughs> he has a lot of fans, apparently. And uh, so again, there, there was something that you had to bring up, Peggy, for yeah. this. So I was very junior. I didn't get to go to the, the show set buy-offs, but Pat Scanlon came back from a review and he said, John Hench says that we need something on that wall as you leave the Greek scene and head into the Roman scene. There's, there's a wall to your left and we need something from the 12 tables of Roman law on that wall. Well, I'd never heard of that, 12 tables of Roman law, but I went to the library and they contacted UCLA Law Library and the next day I had this tiny little book filled with the 12 tables, all in Latin, and then translations below. I found a piece that nicely filled the wall, and, and then I thought, oh, I don't speak Latin, but I know that there'll be guests of ours who do, so I better know what this says. And it said, if you are summoned to appear in court, you must appear. If you cannot afford transportation, it will be provided for you, but the cart need not be covered with pillows. That's like a travel policy in ancient Rome. <laughs> then we, so um, it, 
it's a little dark there today. I, I saw it yesterday, you know, two days ago, and, and so it's still there, I'm sure. So, um, but then we were in the, we were casting for the senator and the centurion, and I had a Latin speaker because he'd also given me the Greek and Egyptian, but, um, but I needed a second Latin speaker. And someone said, well, you know, there's a kid in the model shop who speaks Latin. His name is Joe Rohde. <laughs> <laughs> and so I recruited Joe, and he and Dr. Degrassi had a brief conversation off to the side agreeing on pronunciation, and then, you know, you go through and the centurion strikes his chest and says, Vale, to be quoque. And that's Joe Rohde. And for Pompeii, you pulled uh, actual, uh, actual graffiti? Actual graffiti from Pompeii and Herculaneum. There's the, a book. The clean stuff. <laughs> well, well, I looked at everything. <laughs> but we only sent you the clean stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's stuff like, I'm in love with the redhead. And you know, the equivalent of your mother wears army boots. I mean, they were, <laughs> felt very contemporary. My favorite thing, we were uh, talking about this uh, ride a, a week or two ago. You said even the research of how they stack their books on their bookshelves was something that you looked at. Absolutely. Well, you know, the wonderful thing is there are so many beautifully detailed manuscripts, illustrations, um, that show the costumes, a lot of the in, the, in the Arab world, the scholars have these sleeves that uh, go inches down below their hands. You can see how they stack their books. I mean, it was just, those visuals were so uh, relevant to providing information to the design team. I, I got a call one day saying, we're doing figure finishing and what kind of makeup did the Egyptian royalty wear? And it turns out they dipped their fingers into henna up to the first digit and malachite on their eyes. And, but you know, the visual things were, the visual references were really, really important, really valuable. Yeah. We talked before about the across, you know, repurposing of the of figures, the AA figures out of the sculpture department. So uh, the Pharaoh is Andrew Jackson from the Hall of Presidents, <laughs> and this, with makeup on. <laughs> this scene had such beautiful, the, all that mosaic work, like when you oh, look at these gorgeous. pictures, it's really the first time I really appreciated like how much effort was put into the sets, and I'm sure that all came from the work that you were doing. We actually, there was an amazing book in the, the IRC that was being used, it was being used for the Morocco Pavilion, and um, that book, I actually pulled a lot of those patterns, and the ones on the wall are called Zalij, and um, the ornate shape and the arches above are called Mukarna, and um, we had a lot of fun. Those were all stenciled, by the way. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Here's our favorite dude. <laughs> yeah. The guy on the left never gets any credit, the actual, like, worker. <laughs> Everyone, he's yeah. He's doing his job. Right, yeah. he's just doing his, doing his nine to five, and the guy on the right is Glover, Grover Cleveland, by the way. Oh! <laughs> That's funny. So and here's another incident where you uh, got some real life inspiration. Yeah, John Stone, uh, I mean Harvey Mayo, was one of the uh, outstanding characters in the model shop. And um, it was his job to replicate the, at one inch scale the Gutenberg press. And after a couple of weeks, he came up to me all excited holding this press, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And I marveled at it. I turned it in my hands and everything else. And he goes, just a minute, Richard. And he takes the press, and he puts it on the table. He takes this, takes this tiny little piece of paper, and he puts it on the bed of the press. And he turns the press screw, and he turns it back, and he pulls off this printed page uh, at one inch scale of the Gutenberg Bible. <laughs> I said, John, you know, I understand your passion and everything, but really didn't have to go that far. <laughs> but you got to see the real Gutenberg. Well, there is a Gutenberg Bible at the Huntington Library, and so we got in touch with the curator of rare books and manuscripts, and, and they brought us into their 
archives. White and, gloves. Oh, yes. But I got to hold a book that had been written in 800, so the time of Charlemagne. And the handwriting was as immediate as if you'd seen a letter from your grandmother. You know, it was just you, the ink, the hand, you, you saw it all. And then we were able to get um, a reproduction of an actual page from the Gutenberg Bible. Yeah, I just, this, all of this astounds me of like the levels of details that were put into, the, that you would never know, but like I love just all of this effort that you put in to make it real. It's like, it makes it so wonderful. We just hate getting letters. Right? But <laughs> I answered every guest letter for, for the next 20 years. <laughs> Anybody had a question? <laughs> Thank you. And the, the musicians in that scene, these were actually musicians with Renaissance instruments, the Lyra de Gamba, and I don't remember the name of the second one, but they came in and they played authentic Renaissance instruments and, and Renaissance music. So it was, you know, it was fun meeting people who have that same passion that you have. And I, and I, put, in the, I put in the bad picture of the sculpture. It's, it's, this, this sculpture is no longer in this form because apparently you cannot show, you know, boobs. So, <laughs> so that's the original 82 version, which, is, which got redone in 94. Was there anything with, so I, I, I vaguely remember this debate of like which hand Michelangelo used to paint, whether he was left-handed or right-handed. Well, we, were, we were debating still whether he was actually laying down or standing up. Do you know, John? Did, um, was, was he laying down or standing up on the scaffold? Oh, would he actually be? Oh, how do you actually You weren't him? there, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to object to that because actually I was there. Uh, <laughs> I was in Rome doing the film Agony in oh, the that's Ecstasy. Right, that's right. <laughs> uh, when we built the Sistine Chapel literally to scale uh, on a uh, stage at, uh, outside of Rome. And, one of the world's biggest stages. So coming back and seeing this always jogs my memory a little bit. But yes, he did lay down on his back okay. for, for uh, a good portion of the time. And uh, he, uh, of course, was the world's most amazing sculptor that got positioned and forced into painting the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and the, uh, the whole idea of this notion of telling story through imagery, and it's really the continuous kind of story from the cave wall. You know, and it progressed from the cave wall to stained glass windows and cathedrals to Michelangelo painting, you know, in the Renaissance painting uh, frescoes. And one of the things that I think is interesting is the, this, this tremendous amount of research is, is so important. Uh, and it's important because the, the attempt is to uh, entice the audience, to immerse the audience into the idea. And I think John Hinch used to say quite correctly that our job is to eliminate the contradictions. And, and, and we really, as designers, need to sit there, and, and that's just what all this research accomplishes. It eliminates the contradictions and makes the, uh, invites the audience to be more immersed in the story. And the better job we do to immerse you, and that's one of the exciting parts of Disney's contribution, was uh, those of us in live action film, you know, we deal with a flat screen, and Walt came along and said, no, it's not gonna work anymore. You know, I'm gonna pour my audience into the story. I'm going to put them on Main Street and let them walk through the experience. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the ride tech, technology and the ride systems enhance that even further, where we picked you up off your feet and put you into the story. Uh, so I, I, you can't really do a good job in this world of storytelling until you deal with those issues, especially this issue of research and authenticity and audience immersion. So we sail into the age of invention with our friend the paper boy and uh, this oh, was on. one second yeah oh it should have oh it didn't work i had his audio because <laughs> oh. oh but it's not playing so darn it if it's already burned into your brain yeah or it, no, after hearing it yeah. new york daily it's so <laughs> i would have blew out the mic trying yeah. to do it yeah, but again, this was, uh, you said you pulled a patent. We found a patent model, drawings of an actual 
uh, printing press from the period. And so we had the, did you guys build it from that? Yes. <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> And we also have the, uh, the telegraph office, which again, accurate in, in the uh, message that's being relayed. We found a, ca a calendar from, uh, the, from the month, the day, when the Golden Spike was being, had been driven uh, for the Transcontinental Railroad. And it's, it appears on the back wall of the telegraph office as he's dictating the the news of the Golden Spike being driven. And you had a funny story about finding a appropriate piece of film to be part of the cinema scene uh, that was here. So we needed, we needed a piece of black and white with sound um, from a, I was thinking from a film, and I can't tell you how many, how many uh, VHS tapes I looked at and I'd find 45 seconds and then it would cut to something totally unrelated and I was in tears in my office I remember Francis Geisen came in to comfort me and oh. say it's gonna be okay you'll find something and then we found Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing in top hat and it was so glorious it was just so beautiful and it's something that everybody was familiar with as well and so. it was so clear the the photography was so clear now I think it's um, newsreel which would have been so much easier <laughs> <laughs> I always like the microphone saying um, WDP on it, which they changed like recently, but I thought that was a really neat touch to like have a little Walt Disney Productions like nod in there. So we go on into the future and you had told me that uh, someone from NASA had helped you get, get the audio for this, for the, uh, well, for the moon landing? You know, we were meeting so many amazing people throughout the course of developing Epcot through our advisory boards and and just because um, people of all in all walks wanted to help us, and so we met um, a fellow named Joe Allen. Um, do you remember him? He he had been the he'd been the voice when um, when um, they when I guess his his voice is the eagle has landed. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so he, he was, he came in, he was wonderful and, and gave us a connection to NASA and we were able to get the, the, some of the dialogue, or some of the, you know, dialogue between the mission control and the astronauts. This was when, um, also the telephone scene, starting with the telephone scene um, and going through to the uh, communication center. Uh, we had to become less literal in the staging and more, you know, suggestive. And that's when the black, that's when we use the most black paint in the facilities. <laughs> we had to make everything else go away. It is really interesting how you go from very dimensional surrounded sets to all of a sudden these kind of floating sets. And uh, especially uh, with that telephone scene with the windows, yeah. that just kind of, with no brick behind them, but just right. the suggestion of the building it, it with the windows and the people in it. It would have been to do a literal set right, at the right. time. So we just had to sort of blow it up and stretch it out. But people get it. Yeah, it just, it's just I love that um, those elements of stagecraft that end up in, in the older Disney uh, attractions. It's just really neat to see that. So we head off into outer space. <laughs> and that th that uh, space station is still there. Is it? Yes. It's just painted black now so that you don't know that it's there. The figure probably isn't anymore, but it's, how would you remove it, right? So, right. So right. yeah, if you could go into Spaceship Earth today, if you know where to look, it's like that spaceship that that woman is in is actually still there. Right, uh, if you could look past Hugh Darley turning the... Right. Turning the <laughs> and so, speaking of Hugh, so here's, here's the top again. And Hugh kind of told us that story of... Uh, of like turning the ships, but I always thought this was fascinating. Just uh, the one on the right is just uh, the light effects when you make the transition from the um, from the communication center out into space. So it's just really fascinating. Um, and it just oh, and this was a long-standing question that I had: it was like, was there ever anything intended to be on that 
uh, upper ramp that we always see that you just kind of clear past. And you told me that uh, it was structural, right? The extra piece of the spiral ramp that goes up? Um, the down ramp was tied to the structural steel. Everything was tied to the structural yeah. steel. But um, that was, um, you know, people ask if it goes, the floor goes all the way across. The floor appears to go all the way, you know, to the sphere on either side, but it's still not a structural component of the, of the sphere. You know, the structural steel comes from that first platform built up from that. Right. And I hate to put you on the spot because I never got a chance to ask you this before, but I had heard that there was a little bit more of an elaborate set piece up at the top, as if you were on the moon. Oh, they were, there were a lot of proposals for that. And um, w one of the post opening, you know, as time went by, was uh, and Tony Baxter, I think he proposed that the final, the most ultimate communication that you could have may be communicating with um, extraterrestrials, you know, and that would be the pinnacle of communication is speaking to someone outside the world. And uh, I think I did a rendering of that and I kind of followed Bob McCall's style because he's the best space guy I know. And uh, that's somewhere in the morgue, but um, that was one of many treatments for the for the dome. Neat. Tony, was I right on that? Yeah. Okay. He didn't bring it up. <laughs> so uh, before too long, there was a change. Uh, it only took four years, and the bell system turned to AT&T, and Ugh. you got a new narrator and a new show uh, at the end, especially. It was Walter Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were we were getting guest letters and it was pretty clear that the sets were so powerful so people were so intent on looking at the scenes but in that respect i think their eyes were sort of overriding their ears and so they weren't really they weren't really connecting this very poetic who are we where have we come from the answers begin in our past and the dust from which we were formed. So they were losing the thread and, and, and I think the solution to go with Walter Cronkite, I think a young Tom Fitzgerald wrote the, the yeah. script and Walter Cronkite's delivery, he was, he was the most trusted man in America. His voice was so distinctive and he spoke in short, direct sentences and it was the perfect antidote to people kind of missing what, what our story points were. I think we're done. Closing comment? Yeah, please do. Please. Just to, just to uh, not to leave you in space, uh, <laughs> but uh, at, at the conclusion of the show, uh, we were going to invite everyone out into Communicore and talk about, uh, talk about the pavilions and things to come. At that time, we'd, we'd been toying and doing a lot of research with, uh, with uh, communications, obviously. And the internet was, wow, uh, I can't remember this was 40 plus years ago. I think uh, the extent of the home computer was an 8K Atari. Uh, but we had done some research and we'd looked into DARPA and we looked into what they were beginning to talk about with the internet. And uh, coincidentally, about 10 years later, I got a contract with DARPA to pursue that kind of technology. And the, the only thought I, I, I'd like to close with is that, you know, the Epcot being an experimental prototype community of tomorrow, and back 40 years ago, communities were brick and mortar urban kinds of solutions. And today, it's totally different. You know? Today, communities are international, they're digitally driven, and people can gather together and make communities without ever being in the same physical space. And so this idea of a city, of modeling a city of the future, a community of the future, of a gathering of people with common interests, just as you're gathering here, uh, I think is, an, is an, important, an important concept as you begin to think about what's next. Right. Let's hear it for our guests, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.